In your presence, God, I publicly express sorrow for the many sins by which I have offended you. I resolve to amend my life, to improve and sanctify, endeavoring henceforth to serve you faithfully all the days of my life. I ask all those who dwell within the Church of Christ, the Blessed Mother Mary, the Holy Apostles, martyrs, and faithful, who have lived and suffered and died for the gospel of Jesus Christ, as well as you, my brothers and sisters, to witness my confession and pray for me to our Lord God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and remission of our sins. May our Lord Jesus Christ absolve you, and with his authority vested in me, I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Show us your mercy, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, most gracious Father, that with purity of heart, we may worthily fulfill this holy action established in remembrance of the Last Supper and the death of Jesus Christ, and for our sanctification and salvation. Be present among us, Jesus, our most perfect Master, because you said there were two or three are gathered together in my name, you are among them. We also ask, Lord, that through this holy liturgy, we may experience a spiritual revival and a better understanding of your holy will, bringing us together in one great family, guided by your commandments, and by love, truth, and justice. Amen. And may we say together, let us praise the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, indivisible, revealed in triune power for all time, now, and forever. <coughs> Glory to God in the highest, and peace Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God, and God, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world and have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, and you alone are the Lord, and you alone are the Most High.
Alleluia, alleluia. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Alleluia. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, as you cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me, so I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Jesus said, Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was the Pharisee and the other was the tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the others, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector, he stood off at a distance. He would not even dare to raise his eyes to heaven. But instead he beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Jesus actually goes, he enters into the home of a Pharisee, 
and there he discusses with them, he dines with them, he meets with them. So Jesus doesn't ignore them. He doesn't, you know, simply abandon the religious leaders and say, you know, you're good for nothing. I'm not going to give you any chance of God's revelation and his chance to come into heaven. But his message is always, always on the side of the outcast, even when he's in the midst of the connected and the powerful. Jesus' message doesn't change just because now his audience is a different audience. His message stays on track. He's always standing with the outcasts, the ones who everybody else pushes away. Jesus is there to bring God to them. I was visiting a person this past week who was obviously extremely intelligent and very knowledgeable about Christianity. He was extremely an interesting man and a very moral person. He's also now a Buddhist who still appreciates Jesus as a teacher, but not as a savior. He changed his faith, he told me, because he could not accept that any human being, whoever has lived, even Jesus himself cannot embody the perfection and the fulfillment that is God. But I didn't get into the conversation with him because it wasn't the proper time, but Jesus isn't about making God's perfection visible. Think about the story of the transfiguration. You go up on that mountain, Jesus is a, you know, appears as the Son of God. He's there with Moses and Elijah. The three human disciples who had been with Jesus, who maybe were a little bit prepared for such a revelation, they had no idea what was happening. They couldn't process it. Think about the resurrection. Mary Magdalene could not recognize Jesus any longer by the way he looked, and yet Mary was so close to Jesus. Instead, Jesus is about making God's humanity visible. In Jesus, we know as Christians that God has walked in our shoes, that God empathizes with our situation. Jesus wasn't about proving the power and the magnificence of the Almighty. Jesus is the revelation of a God who loves us, flaws and all, and a God who loves us even more when we need it more. And this is why Jesus comes in such an ordinary fashion. No one is beyond the reach of Jesus because he is all of us. You know, it's a new fall te television season. Usually I don't have a lot of shows to watch, but I, I have become a fan of a, a new sitcom that just came out. It's called Speechless. And it's about a family of five. There's a mother, a father, and three children. But the oldest child is severely handicapped. He's almost completely paralyzed, and he has to communicate only by moving his head with a little light beam. And he, he goes to one of those speech boards where he can, you know, spell out a word or say a couple of words that way. And that's how, you know, absolutely handicapped this young man is. Now, the mother in this comedy, she obviously loves her husband. She loves all of her children. But the love for her firstborn, because he needs it more, is far more obvious. She doesn't love one more than the other, but she shows her love more for the one than the others because that one needs it more. You know, God loves us all, but for the ones who need it more, God loves more. I remember speaking with a really good friend of mine who I haven't really been able to talk to, Reverend Richard Killo. He's, you know, he's uh, moved over, to, I think, to South Catholic. And I don't talk to him as much as I should, but when we were closer and we used to talk a lot, he once told me the story that, uh, that someone shared with him that if Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, were in the darkest, most hideous part, the corner of hell that not even the other sinners in hell would go to, if Judas were there, he said that Jesus would then be there also, trying to comfort him. Jesus never throws away anyone. Reverend Killo's message is that God's love in Jesus is absolutely boundless. It's not like we love. We usually love those who love us back, but Jesus loves because that's his nature, and that's the nature of God. Jesus doesn't make the power and the perfection of God plain as day by walking around in sandals with his feet dirty and a motley crew of unemployed people hanging on, nor as he reaches out to the other ones who are also unemployed on the fringe of society, the ones who really can't find their place, but he surely makes clear in that lifestyle that God loves us all, and the ones that need it more, he loves them even more. So now with all of that said about the parable, who's the fourth person in that parable? Well, every time Jesus speaks, it's us. Like I said, even though the tax collector stands back in the shadows, his story is front and center. He's the person so broken that he dares not even raise his eyes to look up to God because he thinks that he's in utter despair and that he's not even sure that his prayer will be heard. All he can muster for a prayer is to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He can't see him as anything else besides just a sinner in God's eyes. And he doesn't know because he's a sinner that God will even listen to him. 
He's probably not sure if God even cares about him. And I think when the writers at Walt Disney were coming up with the Gypsies prayer and the Hunchback of Notre Dame, that's back in the time when my girls were young and I remember watching the Hunchback of Notre Dame cartoon, they had this tax collector, well, I'm sure they had this tax collector in mind. Esmeralda is the gypsy. She sings her prayer in this absolutely gorgeous, awe-inspiring French cathedral. It just makes you stand back and, and just in wonder. But it's not the cathedral that brings God close. And she sings the words, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if you're even there. I don't know if you would listen to a gypsy's prayer. Yes, I know that I'm an outcast. I shouldn't even speak to you. Still, I see your face and wonder, were you once an outcast? <laughs> and as she's singing those words in that absolutely gorgeous building, she's looking at a statue and into the face of the baby Jesus who is being held by his mother. For all of the magnificence of that building, for all the majesty of that cathedral, it is the ordinary human face of Jesus that brings God close. That's his perfection. That's his purpose. The humanity of God in Jesus. That's what Jesus brings God, that's the way Jesus brings God into our world. For all of us, and especially for those in utter despair, for those who need God the most, they should know, they have to know by all of our proclamations that he understands, that he sees us as so much more than only a sinner, that Jesus was an outcast too. We're the fourth person in that parable, and the whole message of that parable is we can always, always lift our eyes to God, that we can always, always know that he's there, that he listens. Nobody in the eyes of God is only a sinner. You know, Alice was just up in the sanctuary a little while ago, and she read from 2 Timothy. Most scholars agree that this was not an epistle written by Paul himself. It was more likely written by a disciple of his, and maybe even after Paul had already died. Paul was executed because of his faith in Jesus, and in those days, there were Christians who were only few and far between, and he had every reason to feel absolutely alone. Instead, as told through the memory of one who was close to him, we hear that while Paul, as that witness of Jesus, while he was all by himself, while he's ready to face execution, no one is there to stand up for him, Paul still believes, according to the words of 2 Timothy, that in Paul's mind, it says, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength all by himself, ready to be executed because everybody was opposed to whatever he said about Jesus, Paul still said, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength. That's the reality. That's the power of believing in Jesus. That's the message that Jesus wants us to hear in his parable about the tax collector hanging back in the shadows, afraid to even look up at God. No one is ignored by such a God. Every one of us is loved by Jesus. And those who need it the most, maybe it doesn't seem fair to the rest of us who maybe come to church every Sunday, who would have a regular, ordinary life, but the ones who need it the most, Jesus loves them the most. Hopefully that assurance gives us the strength to be who we are supposed to be. And for this we pray, in Jesus' most holy of names, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.
Are there any other prayers that you would like to offer from the congregation? Yes. Pray that we do God's will at this upcoming synod. Thank you very much. Uh, there's four of us from the church that will be taking off for the synod on uh, Thursday evening. The synod is Friday and Saturday. Teresa is one of them. And uh, I do, uh, I think if you could, especially uh, here now, and then also on Friday and Saturday, keep the synod in your prayers. Maybe a little prayer for little baby Gemma. And are there any others? Okay. I'm sorry, one more. <laughs> <laughs> for all of these prayers, Lord, plus the private ones that we bring before you in the, the privacy of our own thoughts, and plus we ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one of us here gathered and to be with those who are perish who are not able to be with us here today, and those who are perish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God and God made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified and conscious life. Suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again and fulfilled the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no way. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism and the forgiveness of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and my life in the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Just person's sacrifice is most pleasing, nor will it ever be forgotten by God. We receive from your most sacred hands, most gracious Father, the sacramental bread, the same faith and trust that the apostles and disciples of your Son and our Savior we said to them, I myself am the bread.
be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Receive this offering, most holy Trinity, which we make in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, that may add to their honor and aid our salvation. May they, whose memory we honor on earth, intercede for us in heaven. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be accepted to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, accept these gifts of bread and wine that we have offered to you. May they make us one with Christ and also with each other. We ask this through the same, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Do not be distressed or fearful. 
you will suffer in the world, but take courage. I have overcome the world. If you live in me, and my words stay a part of you, you may ask what you will, and it will be done for you. Anyone who loves me will be, will, uh, will be true to my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. I consecrate myself for their sakes now, that they may be consecrated in truth, that all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me, I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. After these and other words of the archpriestly prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hand, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. In like manner after supper, taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again he gave thanks to you, blessed him, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. as well as the blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension, we receive from your own gifts and presence a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, and with an unshakable faith that they will become for our souls the saving remedy. We humbly ask, you, Almighty God, to grant that our offering be brought by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar into the presence of your divine majesty. <clears throat> that we who receive the most sacred body and blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and who have passed on to eternity. who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with all your saints who shed their blood for your name. Their hearts were always open to justice and mercy, and their lives patterned after the divine master, merited eternal joy. Number us in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. By whom you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, it's to you, God the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory. Forever and ever. Let us pray, instructed by our Savior's teaching, as followed by an example, we say with confidence,
And by the intercession of the blessed and glorious Mother of God, Mary, together your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, is also Andrew and all the saints, grant us peace in our day, supported by the help of your mercy. May we always be free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Through the same, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. bring us sanctification and eternal life. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom. You live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused for my judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master awakened in me a living faith, fervent love, worship, adoration, and a holy longing. Through this communion, make me your willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it last to me tightly with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives and reigns with God the Father, in the unity with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. What shall I return unto the Lord for all the grace that he has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Body and the blood of Christ. Body. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, said Jesus, for I am meek and humble of heart. The Lord be with you. Thank you. 